So what if we wanted to spend, like Andreas mentioned a bit as well, uh, there are a lot of work being done by the community, by the maintainers to integrate Spiffy and Spire between the broader ecosystem. So I'll provide a quick recap on that. Um, in addition, we have uh, some interesting work being done by a few community members uh, that they'll be sharing and giving an update around that as well. Um, so, so first of all, Spiffy Inspire, um, I think the team has been really busy since the last KubeCon. We have added various integrations. We already are integrated with uh, popular cloud platforms, bare metal, um, different service mesh, um, and other open source software. Um, so do check, you can check these integrations out on the GitHub URL mentioned there. Uh, but again, this is the integration that we know, of, right? Uh, we have a growing co uh, community of contributors who are doing integrations, doing contributions all the time. Uh, we don't really know about them until, you know, they, they get, you know, included in the upstream as well. Um, so if you have any other integrations in mind, if you want to contribute to any integrations, if you're looking to integrate Spiffy Inspire with anything else, you know, do reach out to us. Um, so some of the new stuff that has been recent, uh, a lot we have seen a lot of service mesh um, have started to use uh, Spiffy Inspire. Um, Network Service Mesh, which is a CNCI project uh, focused on delivering hybrid multi-cloud IP service mesh. Um, I think uh, how, are tightly integrated with Spiffy Inspire. Uh, Frederick, is also, who is one of the maintainers of the project, will also be doing a session later on um, on, on his uh, integration story within his organization as well. Uh, we also have Nginx recently introduced a service mesh, um, and the solution is integrated with Spiffy, as Spiffy Inspire, as is a core identity uh, control plane. Faisal will be mentioning that a bit in his CRD session later on as well. Uh, open Service Mesh is another upcoming uh, open source project. It's a lightweight, extensible cloud native service mesh. Uh, there are definitely plans there to integrate with Spiffy and Spire um, as well. Dapper, uh, a new, uh, a relatively new event-driven programming uh, model uh, driven by the Microsoft team, I believe. Uh, they recently had a new release and uh, the Dapper workload certificates are now Spiffy s compliant and carry a strong Spiffy identity for each workload. Um, in addition, we have Emissary from GitHub, is, which is a bridge between service proxy. Um, Spiffy is applied there to apply, you know, auth and auth C policies uh, within that. Uh, tool as well. Um, we also have uh, an integration pretty much uh, done between another open source project, Parsec. Uh, I won't talk too much on that because Paul from that project will be talking in a bit. Um, so as I said, mentioned before, the next upcoming talks are by community members who have done some interesting work uh, with Spiffy Inspire. So with that, I'll ask um, Doran from IBM to unmute. Hey, Doran. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, uh, shall I begin? Yep, go for it. Tell us okay. about the interesting stuff you've been doing with Istio okay. Inspire. Right, and then just, uh, you, can you move back to the previous slide in just a second? Yeah. Oh. Ah, okay, so I thought uh, my email should be there. Okay, never mind. Uh, you can move to the next uh, slide. Okay, so yeah, my name- is in the last slide, Doran. Uh, apologies about that. What we left your contact information on your finishing slide, not on the first, just for consistency with everyone else. No problem. Okay. Uh, so my name is Doron Khan. Uh, I work at the uh, IBM Haifa Research Labs in Israel. And uh, thank you for attending uh, my short talk. Uh, I work on an open source project called the Mesh for Data that enforces data access governance policies in a service mesh. And uh, the link should have been on the slide, but it is not. Anyway, so I, I'm going to describe a proof of concept work that we carried out a few months ago in which we tried to replace the Istio identi identity issuing mechanism with that of Spire. So for those of you unfamiliar with Istio, Istio is an open source service mesh project. Now, hmm. Okay, uh, Istio already issues Spiffy identities and uh, the slide should have uh, shown us uh, what they look like. But anyway, um, they are based on uh, namespaces and service accounts. So Istio issues, issues identities solely based on namespaces and service accounts. Uh, but if you use Spy on the other hand, you can base identities on a wide range of conditions 
and not just the namespaces and service accounts. So we, we were particularly interested in determining the identity of a workload based on the container images of all containers running within a pod. In our proof of concept experiment, we use Spire to issue the same spiffy identities that would have been issued by the Istio identity mechanism. So a few words about our motivation. Using Spire allows us to only issue identities after an attestation process has taken place, ensuring that all required, required conditions are met. Implicitly, this also means that if the conditions are not met, then the workload will not get any identity and would not be able to, to communicate with any other services. The main use case for using Spire identities is federation. Federation would allow workloads running within Istio to communicate, to communicate with workloads in other Istio clusters. It would also allow workloads in Istio to, com to communicate with workloads running outside of Istio in just about any environment. Unfortunately, we did not get around to actually experiment with uh, federation. A few words about how we replace the Istio mechanism with that of Spire. In Istio, the proxy sidecars receive their identities through a Unix domain socket that they share with an Istio agent running in the same container. Most of our work involved changing Istio configuration so that identities would be received from a different Unix domain socket, that of the Spire node agent. We also had to make some minor changes to the Spire code so that Spire would support the proxy sidecar, um, sorry, the, pro, um, the proxy sidecar configuration, which is automatically generated by Istio. These changes were approved and merged into the Spire repository. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so finally, if you are interested in this work, uh, you have here the, a link to our repository. It explains how to recreate our experiment step-by-step. Step. We welcome contributions. Below it, you can find a link to a blog that we wrote explaining in greater detail our motivation for this work. That's it, uh, thank you for your attention. Great, great. Thank you so much, uh, Doran. If you, if you can hang around for a few minutes, if you have any questions for Doran, feel free to put them in the chat window. There's the option of you know, interacting with Doran on the Kiko chat feature as well, which was the browser that you used to get into the Zoom chat. Um, up next. Umar, real quick, do you mind going back two slides? Uh, I think your update just reflected on, on what had been missing from Doran's slide. Uh, just want to people to part with. Yeah, I have to, I think, we need to stop and, yeah, present again. Yeah, there are apologies about that. No problem. I think there was a URL here. That is the schema that Istio follows as the naming convention, right? Right. That's the point you wanted to illustrate. Okay. Any any particular you want to redirect your attention about like what are the, the sharp eight edges or, or trade-offs here? Perhaps like you need to have parsing and everything else. Expect that if you're at the time you're doing federation, things would need to look pretty much the same in other service meshes, correct? Uh, right. So in order not to, to break things, we, we used the same schema as, uh, as Istio. So that did not change, but the mechanism of, give, of giving the, the identities is, is now totally different. So um, uh, we can use all, all, uh, all Spire selectors um, in order to, to determine what conditions need to to occur in order for, for an identity to be given. 
this is as long as you, you stay within the, the Istio framework. If you are trying to federate with other environments, then you can use different schemas. Right. And reason about it more as a as a syntax than perhaps encoding too much semantics in the structure of, of the string, right? Right. Great. Thank you very much. We're very excited about this integration and, and thanks again for leading the charge and showcasing how Istio can integrate with Spire. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Oren. Up next, we have uh, Andrew Jessup. He's going to talk about another popular topic, topic, transitive identity. Andrew, you're on. Hi, everyone. Quick sound check. Can everybody hear me? Yep, perfect. Beautiful. Um, hopefully, my internet holds out. Apologies if it doesn't. Um, so uh, I, I know we've only got a couple of minutes together. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thanks for joining. We're going to spend a couple of minutes on, on this topic of transitive identity. Um, firstly, I wanted to recap what transitive identity is. Uh, and I've, I tried last night uh, at about midnight to come up with a, a sort of a concrete pithy definition. I'm not sure I succeeded, uh, but let's try anyway. Um, what, what transitive identity is, is about adding additional authentication context to a receiving workload. So that in addition to being able to verify the identity of my proximal immediate call up, uh, I can also uh, bring into my uh, authentication and authorization decision additional authentication context about upstream parties that might have been involved in, in an interaction. Um, perhaps a, an easier way of explaining this might be to look at some actual use cases. Um, so uh, a common one here is, is delegated authentication. So as an example, on the left-hand side here, we've got a, a user, Michelle, she logs into a web application. Uh, let's say that web application is maybe like a, a mail client. Um, and the, the web application then, which is authenticated Michelle, is now going to talk over a private API to a, a backend system in order to retrieve, uh, uh, re retrieve Michelle's mail. Uh, so in this scenario, the web application needs to authenticate to the backend. Uh, and hopefully, they're using uh, Spiffy in order to s perform that authentication. So the backend now knows and can prove who the web app is, but doesn't know who Michelle is uh, and doesn't have any proof that the web application um, has actually interacted with Michelle and is, is uh, entitled to retrieve uh, the uh, uh, you know, uh, mail records on Michelle's behalf. Um, it effectively just has to trust that the web app is entitled to do that. Uh, and in some simple cases, that's probably OK. But in more complex scenarios, particularly when you have you know, multiple call chains of microservices where you've got uh, organiza you know, uh, organizations running shared services where they don't necessarily trust uh, the upstream party completely and they want to provide additional guarantees, it would be nice if the back end, the team running the back end infrastructure was able to verify not only that the web app was the party calling them, but also that Michelle had authorized uh, the retreat, uh, was that the web app had a uh, uh, a valid authentication context from Michelle, and maybe even a valid authorization context as well to retrieve email. Um, this sort of scenario plays out in a lot of uh, a lot of organizations where microservice development is getting uh, more uh, be becomes more um, uh, becomes more mature and embeds itself into a more disparate organization. Uh, uh, another use case that's, that's similar, um, but uh, is, is quite an interesting one, is when you have a long running task that a user has initiated. So by a long running task, that might be, say, uh, a render job. Uh, it might be a CICD job. Uh, but any case, really, where you know, as a, as a user, again, I've gone and interacted with some system, and that system is spinning off a job on my behalf. Again, let's say it's a CICD job. Um, that job is going to run for potentially a long time. It may run asynchronously, or it might even start after I've left my, left my machine and, and gone to bed. Um, in other words, I'm not in front of a console anymore to be able to authenticate as this particular task. So what we need is a way for this, uh, on the right-hand side here, uh, this task to be able to uh, represent itself uh, as Michelle, uh, as the user who's logged in, and at least be able to represent itself to a subset of the entitlements of Michelle. Uh, so this is another case where some idea of transitive identity would be useful here. It would be fantastic if the task was able to present not only its own identity as a workload, but also Michelle's identity or a, a proxy for Sh Michelle's identity, or for that matter, the scheduler's identity as well, to a resource in order to be able to, for the resource to be able to make that kind of authorization decision. 
And there's a few variations of these kinds of use cases as well. Um, it's, a, it's a complex and fairly challenging problem, it turns out. It's, uh, and one that Spiffy today doesn't really solve. Again, Spiffy is really all about the, you know, immediate, uh, the immediate proximal identity of a caller. So the web app, so the back end authenticating the web app or uh, the resource authenticating the task, but not the broader context that these things are operating in. So uh, the, we set up, so to fix this, if we skip to the next slide or to address this, Beautiful. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, at the end of last year, actually, we set up a working group called the Transitive Identity Working Group. Uh, I forgot to put the link on there, but uh, if, you, if you browse around our, our Slack channels, we'd be happy to point you in the right direction if you're interested in joining this working group and participating in this process. Uh, but we set up a working group to explore this problem. Uh, and we started that working group by uh, soliciting some real world case studies. So uh, we had some colleagues from folks like Bloomberg and Adaptance and Netflix. Um, you know, all took their time out to uh, uh, walk through how they were, uh, would like to, or either were employing transitive identity in the real world. And those grounded real world use cases uh, turned out to be really important because when it comes to a topic like transitive identity, there's a lot of trade-off decisions you can make between complexity and ease of implementation and robustness and security and, and seeing how people had solved for those problems in a, in a, in a grounded real world setting helps us make some of those design decisions. Uh, so we uh, we went through that. We also went through and reviewed a lot of prior art. Um, there's you know for those who are familiar with specifications like uh, OAuth, uh, OAuth two, uh, or uh, or WS Trust uh, for the for the uh, older folks on the call, uh, uh, or for that matter, you know uh, more interesting kind of delegated grant proposals like uh, Google Macaroons. Uh, uh, there's and for that matter, Istio even flirted with this. There was a thing called the Istio uh, RC token. Um, uh, there's been a lot of there's been many attempts to try and solve this problem in the past, uh, and uh, we spent some time reviewing some of that prior art as well uh, for two reasons. One is we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If there are already great standards to solve for this, let's let that community uh, or let let's uh, figure out how to integrate with and support those standards rather than reinvent the wheel. Uh, and secondly, as well, to make sure that to the extent that there've been standards that are proposed that hadn't really seen adoption in market, what can we learn from that? Uh, what can we do to make sure that we're not repeating those same mistakes? So uh, we uh, uh, so so we we went through and reviewed that, and we came up with you know first of all a set of design principles that we wanted to uh, uh, assert, um, you know a set of kind of grounded principles for what uh, you know Spiffy's implementation or at least initial implementation of uh, of, of transitive identity should be. We actually carved out a subset of that problem we call delegated authentication, uh, and uh, we we put our heads together and put up with a put it, put together a proposal. Um, this proposal is still very much a work in progress. Um, it's uh, uh, you know it's had some uh, you know real world grant you know it's had some it's had some uh, initial review from the uh, 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 working group team. Uh, what we're now doing is is bringing this to uh, Spiffy itself um, and seeing uh, because it the, the proposal as it stands implies some uh, extensions to uh, the Spiffy spec in particular a new uh, token format called the DA SVID for providing delegated uh, uh, asserted claims. Uh, we're now putting that in front of six spec uh, and we're starting that discussion. Um, it's been a really robust, really useful and robust discussion so far. Um, it turns out the problems that we're trying to solve to solve for transitive identity uh, are also problems that people are having in, in other contexts too, where they want to be able to propagate contexts across calls. Um, so we're starting to get into the meat of that discussion now. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, our hope is that you know, uh, uh, with the help of six spec and the help of the broader community, we'll get to a point pretty soon where you know, we'll have a, a concrete proposal that we can we can effectively ratify. Um, the other thing we're doing as part of this is piercing uh, piercing this environment as well, um, and uh, you know, actually actually standing this stuff up in Spire and making sure that it works. Uh, yeah. And uh, so yeah, and uh, so that's uh, all I've got. If you want to check out the design doc, I encourage people to do so. Um, I also encourage folks to uh, uh, jump on the Transitive Identity Working Group. Um, uh, and or join six spec if you're if you're interested in that too uh, and uh, you can find the design doc at the link at the bottom there uh, and with that i'll hand over back to amir aj a quick Great. question from tad taylor why delegated authentication as opposed to delegated authorization uh sure great question so um uh delegated or so uh you know we've we've tried with spiffy in general um to to disaggregates uh, uh, authentication and uh, authorization as much as possible. Um, and, and the reason for that is it's generally easier to provide, to build a, um, 
a general purpose authentication framework that supports a whole set of different use cases um, than it is to provide authentication and authorization in the same form in the, in the way that say OAuth2 does. Um, to the ex greatest extent possible, we've tried to do that with, um, with uh, delegated authentication as well. Um, there's actually some open discussion right now as to whether or not that should be delegated authorization because how useful is just an authentication claim without uh, entitlements associated with that? Um, so uh, uh, I, my, to, to paraphrase my own answer, I'd say you know we started from a, uh, we started from a position of trying to do the you know the simplest, most practical thing that we can. Uh, we're starting to hit the limits of that, and so we are starting to explore delegated authorization as well in some form. Uh, at least having kind of concrete bounded claims that can be passed around. Um, that may capture some uh, authentication authorization decision as well as some authentication decision. Um, would really encourage you to jump in the dark and or jump in the conversation there to, to add your voice there too, because um, we'd love to hear from your experience. Yeah, great, thank you so much, AJ. I know we are pressed for time. Um, I apologize, we're gonna run into the break a bit, but I do have a couple more speakers. Um, up next, as Augustine mentioned about certificate transparency is a big, um, big topic within the Spire community. And we have uh, Reed Zhang from ByteDance. He's gonna take, walk us through his proposal. Yes, can you hear me, Umea? Yep, perfect. Great, and thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. And I'm Reed Zhang and you can also call me Reed. So I currently work at ByteDance and we are known for the creator of TikTok. So here I bet ByteDance, we heavily integrate with the Spire to implement our like identity management system for our production network. And during that, we noticed that in the current Spire, there is actually no very good way to perform auditing on the issued SVs. Like for those who are new to Spire, SV is basically the ID card for an entity in the network. So in this work, um, we try to provide auditability to Spire. We leverage a well-known technology called Certificate Transparency or CT. And CD was first proposed to enforce public auditing on certificate authorities for web PKI. And in our case, we applied the essential ideas of CT to Spire so that we could enforce auditing on all of the SVs issued by the Spire server. And this way it can significantly, significantly mitigate the risk of Spire server getting compromised or having its identity stolen. Without CT, a malicious SV could be introduced into the production network without any notice. And so um, here we will first briefly walk through the original workflow of Spire server issuing SVs. And then we will look at the new workflow with CT added. So in the original case, the Spire agent or workload would first send a request to the Spire server and ask for an SV and the Spire server would perform validation and logging of the request, and then it will issue an SV back. So, and this finished the original workflow of issuance of SV. And the case is slightly different for the, like for the case with CD edit. So, um, could you click? Um, so in the CD case, the old SV would not be trusted the old SV it needs an additional field called SCT in order to be trusted. The spy server would need to fetch this SCT by logging the SV on CT log. This SCT is short for signed certificate timestamp. It represents that the SV can, to be issued would be added to the CT log within some time. And spy server would embed this SCT to all the SV it issues. And now only the new SVs with SCT embedded will be trusted. And this SCT guarantees the enforcement of auditing through a crypto way, cryptographic way. And could you click? And with that, now any interested internal or external auditor can request to the CD log for auditing of all issued SVs. So here in Binance, we would have an internal process, keep fetching from the CD log and look for suspicious SVs. And this sums up the overview of like the new version of Spire with CT integrated. And in this slide, um, we show an example of issued X509 SVs with SCT embedded. The yellow highlighted parts are the SCT field. 
and all newer version of OpenSSL should be able to parse SCT field in the X509 certificate. This certificate is gener generated by our experimental fork of Spire server and our cur current fork, all SVs would have SCT embedded. And these SCTs are actually fetched from our own internal CT service here, I bet, here at Binance. And that's, uh, and that's our, what I want to share. And Umar, can you go back, like, can you go to the, um, the doc link you sent me? Because like I updated the GitHub link and also the design doc link on that version. So can you put it, uh, put them here? Um, I'll put it in the chat window for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, um, and I think we started the, um, the working group three months ago and there have been some like back and forth discussing. And we are also discussing on the um, on the GIFA RFC issue. So you are most welcome to check that out. And yeah, and shout out to the great, uh, great work the SPV community has been working on. And thank you for inviting me. And that's it for me. Thanks, Ruit. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I know we are a bit over. So last but not the least, we have Paul Howard from ARM talking about our second Spiffy. Paul, you're on. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. Oh, cool. Uh, well, uh, what thanks, man. Show, Paul. Sorry? What's that, what's that drawing on that turtle shell in this slide? Uh, I see a little parsec Easter egg in there. Oh wow, that's fa that's fantastic. I, I can't I can't claim credit uh, for the for the handiwork. Um, that that's cool. In the thumbnails, I didn't spot that detail. Yeah, thanks to whoever um, parsecked up the uh, the turtle. That, that's that's awesome. Um, so th thanks, Amir, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to to join this session and quickly talk about the work we're doing uh, with, with Spiffy and Spire and, and Parsec. So just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Paul Howard, uh, Solutions Architect with ARM, um, and I lead an engineering team here at ARM that is contributing into Parsec. Uh, Parsec became a CNCF sandbox project just earlier this year. Uh, and so, so what's Parsec? Well, pa Parsec's the platform abstraction for um, security. Uh, it's providing ways for cloud native applications to access the security facilities of diverse platforms. Uh, so for example, it can handle the complexities of storing private keys uh, in trusted platform modules or secure elements. Um, and, it, and it can give us uniform, simplified interfaces uh, to do those things in our preferred programming languages. Um, and, and this is so that applications can get access to those best available um, hardware security facilities in a decoupled way. So keeping them fully architecture agnostic um, and, and platform agnostic. So that, that's what Parsec is. Now the slide here that Umez put up, so this is showing us how Parsec can make use of Spiffy identities. Uh, this is really valuable for us um, because it allows Parsec to grow beyond uh, just being a platform abstraction for security. Um, by using these reliable application identities, uh, Parsec can support multi-tenancy. So it, it can isolate these different client applications from one another so that they can share the hardware, uh, but they can't perform operations with each other's keys, uh, for example. Um, so the diagram on screen uh, summarizes how, how Parsec can do this with Spiffy identities. So it, it shows this this triangular three-way interaction uh, between the application, uh, the Parsec service, uh, and the Spire service all on the local machine. Um, so the client application links to a Parsec uh, client library. Um, that Parsec client library can obtain the application's Spiffy ID uh, from the local workload endpoint, um, which of course it, it, it can then pass as a JOT token uh, it, in, a, in an auth header. Uh, over to the Parsec service where finally uh, the Parsec service can validate the token back um, with the original workload endpoint. Um, so, so Parsec knows but by this, th this three-way circuit uh, that each API call it receives is coming from a client workload um, with a proven identity uh, and it can, it can then start permitting access to keys uh, on, the, on the basis of, of that identity. 
Um, and the really great news is is that this is an integration that uh, we've we've largely completed. Uh, so it's still work in progress. So it's in the process of being upstreamed uh, in, into Parsec now. We've done a bit of community enrichment around this as well. So there is a Rust Spiffy library because Parsec is a Rust project. Um, there is a Rust Spiffy Parsec library that already existed in community, but we've done some enrichment on that um, as part of this work. Um, there's a lightning talk taking place uh, later today. Uh, that's as part of Cloud Native Security Day. Uh, where Andres uh, and I um, show a demo of this in action. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, we take it at a thousand miles an hour because it's only a lightning talk. Um, but do look out for that, uh, maybe catch the recording. Um, and also, if you have questions for me, uh, either about this integration or, or about Parsec generally, which I've, I've really only given the merest hint of what it is really, um, you can find me on the CNCF uh, and the Spiffy Slack of workspaces. Uh, there's also a Parsec channel um, on the CNCF Slack. Uh, you can come and engage with the entire uh, Parsec community as a whole there. Um, and and that's it, really. So yeah, let, let me uh, let me just say thanks once again um, and head back uh, and hand back to you, Umair. So thanks very much. Great, Paul. Thank you so much um, for doing this.